So as I just said, we are recording, so please keep that in mind. It will be shared post-event uh, via our YouTube channel. My name is Flori Chikowski. I'm the Executive Director here with the Chamber of Commerce for Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows. Uh, we would like to acknowledge the Cape Sea First Nation and Kwantlen First Nation on whose traditional unceded territories we are and Chamber activities take place. And we thank you all for attending and taking the time today for our webinar, webinar, a conversation with the Honourable Aaron O'Toole, serving as leader of the official opposition of Canada and the leader of the Conservative Party of Canada since August 24th, 2020. Now, if you did not pre-submit your questions, uh, you can post them into the Q&A and we'll do our best with time allowing to get to them. To begin, we're first going to hear a few words from our Member of Parliament for Pitt Meadows and Maple Ridge, Mark Dalton. Mr. Dalton. Great. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much and hello everyone. I want to begin by thanking the Ridge Meadows Chamber of Commerce for hosting this event and just want to acknowledge the important advocacy role that the Chamber plays in our communities, in the province and throughout the country and recognize also Al Hogarth, who is the president of the chamber, as well as the board members. And thank you, uh, Flory, for uh, being the executive director. And, and Janaya is here also. So just the great work that you're doing. So uh, for me, it's just a tremendous honor to be able to represent Pitt Meadows and Maple Ridge as a member of parliament since 2019. And then prior, I was the MLA here for eight years. And so it's, it's, uh, I just love to be able to serve and, and work for you. That's my number one priority is what can I do to serve? It's, it's a matter of listening to individuals, to small business owners and advocating and going forward uh, on different issues that you're facing. And my staff and I are here to do all that we can do to assist you. That's the number one priority. And we've been open the entire period of COVID. There's a lot of initiatives that I take and the questions that I, that I ask in Parliament and I speak about in debate, but that comes primarily from what I'm hearing on the ground as I visit small businesses, as I talk to, talk to residents. There's been a lot of gaps we've been, we, during this time that we've been facing as, uh, during COVID. It's been, been a very difficult time for everybody and for small business owners. But I know the, both myself and the Conservative Party and, and our leader, Aaron O'Toole, has been able in the position of opposition to, to bring forth things and actually to, seek to see improvements, whether it be in the SUS, in the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, that initially was supposed to be 10% and now has went up to 75%, or advocating for a more flexible rent assist because a lot of the, the business owners were finding that they weren't able to benefit because the landlords weren't, weren't willing to, you know, to, to, to uh, chip in for, for various reasons, we understand, but we were able to really help uh, in that, or SEBA, the business loans, so, or even CERB. It was uh, punitive initially to small businesses, owners, and uh, proprietors. Was also able to see, uh, service Canada uh, open here locally. Canada Summer Jobs advocating. Another issue, and I've, I've only got a, just a few more seconds, but has been very important in our community has been the, and in British Columbia and across Canada, but has been the opioid crisis. And, and we saw 1,700 people die last year. And that is very troubling. I've, I've been uh, visiting the different uh, rehab treatment centers here locally. And that's an important uh, issue for me and to see people's lives, not just to keep people alive, but to see them transform and have a life. So lastly, I'm just very pleased to say, um, very happy that uh, Aaron O'Toole is here and to, to hear from you and to speak. He's someone that, as someone who is in the inside, I've been very impressed with his leadership and he's put forward a number of priorities that we will be implementing well, if when we become and if we, if we become the next uh, government of Canada. So I'm glad that you're all here and our leader, my leader is here also. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, Flory, for the opportunity. As I was saying at the outset, I wish I was there, but I like to start my events in BC with a bit of a story. When I was 13, I took the train 
from Toronto to Vancouver with my grandfather to see Expo 86. And that's really when my love for British Columbia began. Five years later, I was back as a young Canadian Armed Forces officer recruit. And I can tell you that training at boot camp in the Fraser Valley at Chilliwack was quite different to the experience of my expo trip, but it was a transformative time for me. I later did training at Comox as well. But my true British Columbia highlight was in 2010, when I joined my wife in Vancouver for a month. And while she worked in the International Broadcast Center for the Olympics, I was the lucky husband with tickets, including a memorable day seeing Alexandra Bilodeau win the first gold medal on Canadian soil at Cyprus. British Columbia hosted the most incredible Olympic games and it made Canada proud. I love BC and wish I could be with you in person, but I'm here virtually. You can see I'm also inspired and I'm looking at your beautiful part of our country. But I'm here to discuss the ways we can support small businesses in Maple Ridge and Pitt Meadows as part of Canada's economic recovery after the pandemic. As Mark mentioned, the Conservatives in opposition and myself as leader, we have a job to do to hold the Liberal government to account. Vaccines are now arriving in larger numbers in British Columbia and Ontario and across the country, and that's positive. But with high COVID cases and hospitalizations, tight restrictions and closures across the country, Canadians are all frustrated to see Canada in this deep third wave and far behind our allies in where we should be on vaccine deployment. As a G7 country, Canada used to be a leader, but under Mr. Trudeau, we've increasingly become a laggard. Canada deserves better. We need to see the return of Canadian optimism, Canadian ingenuity, but most of all, we need to see a return of Canadian leadership because the very future of Canada and our prosperity in the future is at stake. Our country, including communities across the lower mainland are at a crossroads. Soon Canadians will decide which path at those crossroads we wanna take. The path of more of the same from the Trudeau government, high deficits, high debt, higher taxes and rising unemployment or a steady and certain path to securing our future. Over a month ago, Mark and I introduced Canada's recovery plan, our plan to secure our future post COVID. Canada's conservatives will enact a comprehensive jobs plan to recover the million jobs lost throughout the pandemic within one year. We'll take immediate action in the hardest hit sectors, helping those who've suffered the most including small business owners, women, and young people. We will work to rebuild the main streets of Maple Ridge, Pitt Meadows, and the rest of Canada by assisting small businesses and providing incentives to invest in, rebuild, or even start new businesses. The second pillar of our plan will enact the toughest accountability and transparency laws in Canadian history. We saw last week where there were more guilty findings against the Trudeau government when it comes to ethics. So from the prime minister's office to the chief of defense staff of our Canadian armed forces, Canadians want accountability, transparency, and trust restored in our institutions. Canadians are tired of endless ethics scandals with the Trudeau government. Third, this last year has deepened British Columbia's mental health crisis, Canada's mental health crisis. Families and communities across the, the country are struggling more than ever. As Mark mentioned, last year, the opioid crisis hit British Columbia more than any other province. And we're sad to say in the first quarter of 2021, nearly 500 people have died of drug overdoses in British Columbia. The highest number of fatal overdoses ever recorded in the first three months of a year. Each life, represents a family that is forever scarred and the promise of a life lost. I showed my children many months ago when the Globe and Mail featured the faces of the opioid epidemic. So many of them were young people. As a parent, as a parliamentarian, as someone asking the country to trust them as prime minister, I think we must do more as a society to help those 
And I've promised my kids when I show them those photos that we will do that. We will introduce a Canada Mental Health Action Plan and boost funding partnerships with the provinces and with nonprofit groups on the ground for mental wellness and healthcare. And we will provide incentives to employers to provide better mental wellness coverage to employees. Fourth, I will ensure our country is never unprepared for a crisis again. Canada's Conservatives will make Canada more resilient, reduce our reliance on countries like Communist China, and take seriously our responsibility to protect the health of Canadians. This includes enhancing domestic capacity, especially in vaccines. Finally, a Conservative government will secure Canada's economy by getting the budget back into balance over the course of the next decade. As I've said, spending to protect Canadians during the pandemic is the right thing to do, but we cannot pass unsustainable debt to our children and to future generations. The spending in the Liberals' latest budget, the first budget in two years, the spending is so astronomical that it puts the future of our country at risk. It puts our growth at risk, jobs at risk. It puts healthcare and old age security at risk. It's a risk for British Columbia as much as it is for Ontario. The Prime Minister wants to test an out of control debt plan with any, without any real stimulus and a continued approach that abandons the natural resource sector entirely. There's also no real fiscal anchor. Canada simply cannot afford more of the same from the Trudeau Liberals and the other parties on the left. They have an Ottawa knows best approach that will continue to lead to ballooning housing costs, higher taxes, growing risk of inflation, and a plan that leaves millions of Canadians behind. For Conservatives, once the recovery starts, we will start to get spending under control. Canada's Conservatives will get the economy growing again to secure the revenue needed to pay for the services British Columbians depend on. And in the process, we will secure jobs for people in all sectors and all regions of the country. Recently, I was also proud to release the Conservative plan for climate change. The Liberal approach to climate change means big government taxing consumers and actually phasing out jobs when we need them the most. The conservative approach will empower Canadians and will reduce emissions while striving to preserve jobs and investment in all parts of our country. In fact, we had a BC-based climate modeling firm verify that the conservative climate change plan will achieve the same emission reductions as the Liberal government's current plan, but will grow jobs and the economy at a dramatically higher rate than the Trudeau plan. It's so important, I'm gonna repeat that. The Conservative Climate Change Plan will match the emission reductions being promised by the Trudeau Liberals without the economic disruption their plan will cause. The decisions we take in the next few years will define Canada for this generation and for the next. As the father of two young kids, my greatest worry is to fail to leave them a better Canada. That's what drives me. And I'm sure that's what motivates you. As we recover from COVID-19, it is time for certainty and competent leadership. Our recovery plan will get the economy back on track in Maple Ridge, Pitt Meadows, and communities across Canada to secure a brighter future for everyone. Thank you, and I look forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Toole, for that. Uh, I just wanted to make a reminder here that uh, the questions being submitted are submitted by the attendees, whether that was pre uh, today or through our Q&A. So the questions are not coming from the Chamber of Commerce. Please note that we are a nonpartisan organization and we are here to inform you, our members and our community. So with that, we will we'll begin with the first question that I have here, and it's disappeared on me. <laughs> Bear with me. So Mr. O'Toole, what do you want to say to businesses struggling to stay open and navigating resources 
where they do not meet requirements. And as a second question or on, on that as well, any new programs that are to be implemented in light of those ending or extensions? Has, have any extensions been considered for some? I know coming up at the end of June, like the uh, rent and those types of things. Go ahead. Thanks, Lori. The question was posed in a perfect way. What do you have to say to those businesses struggling to stay open and access? Hold on, help is on the way. We have throughout this pandemic, as Mark said, approved spending to help Canadians, both individually, families, and businesses. We would often approve programs even when we knew there were flaws in them, like the wage subsidy, like rent assistance, as Mark described at the beginning. And we tried to partner to put the needs of the country first during a crisis. But the government has this terrible, disconnected Ottawa knows best approach that often totally forgets the realities on the ground. So very quickly, we said, we don't need programs just in the SEBA, just through banks. We need to extend that to credit unions, of course, which are used by a lot of small businesses across British Columbia. That was a conservative led initiative. Our million jobs pledge, the first pillar of my Canada recovery plan is going to have tailored programs for sectors that have been the hardest hit like tourism, which is so important to the British Columbia economy, those sectors will need earmarked longer term programs than just the, the standard programs that Mr. Trudeau is running till June. They are going to see a prolonged uh, slow stream of revenues. So they will need specific programs. And we've actually several times over the last six months tried to push for this in Ottawa now. Seven months ago, we were pushing for certainty when it came to, to airlines and assistance programs for them that preserved jobs, preserved regional routes, and had a, an approach to refunds for consumers. But those businesses needed certainty. So we're going to have an enhanced set of measures to incentivize rebuilding of, of small businesses, and even in some cases, expansion or starting of new businesses because here's what's so important, and you at the chamber know this, two thirds of Canadians work for a smaller, medium sized business. So we need to make sure those sectors survive post COVID so that they can thrive and help us grow the economy long-term. So our economic, our Canada recovery plan is step one. You'll see more detailed information as we get closer to the election on just exactly what we're gonna deliver by sector. Thank you for that. Okay. So now, as a chamber, we generally, obviously, we advocate on business, uh, but we do have nonprofit organizations that are members as well. And we are getting a lot of questions that sometimes those nonprofits are not being seen as initially being part of those resources. How would you address that? We've raised that as well. And there are, there are particularly uh, hard hit nonprofit associations that actually also assist with uh, social development and, and, and issues on the grounds and communities. And we need to make sure that they're preserved as well because they enhance the quality of life. They actually tackle a, a lot of the problems that multiple levels of government want to work on. And so this will be an area we've actually, Flory, we've advocated for better support for nonprofits in the short term. And going forward, I'll use an example. The, the third pillar of our Canada recovery plan is mental health. It's something that's very important to me since I left the military. I've done advocacy for, for veterans, first responders, for young people. Um, the, the rates of depression and anxiety in our young people as a result of this pandemic are are quite frightening, to be honest with you. And so we're going to invest heavily. But I know firsthand, having been an advocate and a volunteer long before I became a, a politician, sometimes the most innovative programs are delivered by nonprofits or by charities who are often light years ahead of the government. So our approach to, to building capacity, addressing social need, will be to partner with nonprofits. And so sometimes the federal government can be the funding partner 
set the national standards in terms of oversight of how federal dollars are used, but qualifying nonprofit groups delivering assistance for people struggling with mental health issues, struggling with homelessness or, or other issues for, for people at the margins. Sometimes leadership means following, following the lead of groups on the ground helping. So nonprofits, I think, will see a, a renewed partnership with a conservative government that not only will bridge their time through the pandemic, but will look at them increasingly to, to address issues on the ground in communities. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go to one of the questions here in the uh, Q and A, uh, kind of changing topic here onto the vaccinations. So we have concerns. Some people have had side effects and they're just wanting to understand if the vaccines have not been proven to be effective against the current variants and all new variants and it's come up a few times with today on the freedom of rights as a Canadian. So how would you address that as far as the vaccinations and their effectiveness um, and the freedom of rights of Canadians as well as any enforcement by employers on vaccinations? Important question. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad this has come up. First, for almost a year, I've been saying the three key tools in a pandemic that the government must try and lead on are vaccines, rapid testing, and information. And in recent weeks, the disconnect between Mr. Trudeau and his health minister, between the public health authority, the panel. Of, of experts, NASI, that the government defers to on these things. There's been a different message sent at a time that people are questioning because they're seeing stories. and I have great faith in Health Canada. And all vaccines are effective against variants to various degrees. And that's important to know because a vaccine, if it limits hospitalizations from a variant, that may not make the person immune from the variant, but avoiding respiratory failure, avoiding hospitalization, is a market improvement over no protection at all. So what we're seeing from the science is there's a, there's a variety of, of effectiveness against the more dangerous variants of, of the vaccine. There's no one more frustrated than, than the conservative opposition who, in fact, it was a BC MP from Prince George, my colleague, uh, Todd Doherty, that last January asked about restricting flights to control the pandemic. We were mocked for that position for several months by the Liberal government, by Minister Haiju. Controlling the entry of dangerous variants is another area where the Trudeau government failed by not having adequate stoppages from countries that are hot spots and adequate screening, testing, and quarantining uh, for international flights in particular. We have to learn the lessons from this pandemic. And, and as I said, vaccines, rapid tests, and information are key. Okay, thank you again. All right, kind of going through my questions here. So, um, so we want to ask on the effectiveness of universal programs like OAS in comparison uh, when we're speaking to low income Canadians. Does the Conservative Party have a stance on programs like universal basic income that could reduce, well, we'll go with that, and also benefit uh, 
hardworking Canadians? That's an, another important question. Thanks, Lori. And because right now I talked about that crossroads in my speech. There is the Liberal Party, the NDP, the Green, and in one, in one province, the Bloc Québécois, all on a side about talking about a guaranteed income, turning the CERB into a permanent UBI or something. Uh, we're the only party that actually just wants to get the country back to work. We don't want to incentivize a permanent CERB because we've actually seen how that has hurt small businesses um, by distorting the labor market. And it would change the fundamental character of our economy, which is we want people to work hard. We want no barriers to people living up to their, their best opportunity and best potential. And we want to encourage that striving, that working hard and, and you know, the dream that your kids would go a little further than you would go, uh, you want them to do even better. That, that's fundamental to our fabric. And so we are the only party that has clearly opposed that approach. It's also why we want to see all sectors recover. We want to see a softwood lumber agreement, for example, that would help British Columbia because Mr. Trudeau, under three different presidents, hasn't been able to advance that issue. Uh, we, we want to see strong uh, recovery in our natural resources sector, including energy, because it's the most environmentally and socially responsible in the world. We want better trade deals for steel. The, the aluminum in Kitimat is seven times less carbon intense than Chinese aluminum that Mr. Trudeau has permitted to be imported into to Mexico as part of the new NAFTA. So we need a smarter government. The interesting thing is the Horgan government's report on UBI shows it actually doesn't have the positive impact that the parties on the left suggest it does. What we have to do is work with issues of poverty and provide assistance, a support, training and as much as possible help people get on a path to employment and, and self-sufficiency. And GIS and other programs also allow us to address uh, within the senior population, how can we provide more for folks that, that are slipping, slipping behind? We're committed to that, we're a compassionate party, but we also wanna see an approach to the overall economy that gets our country back to work. Okay, and this ties in with that. So you mentioned support and those that are kind of falling behind. We are hearing a lot from seniors that feel that they're not being addressed in, in the uh, supports. So how would you address seniors that are, are looking for additional support right now? Yeah, this is seniors built this country and, and we need to make sure that that they're secure and we see particularly in your neck of the woods in the lower mainland, but also I'm an MP in the greater Toronto area, we're seeing the rising pressures, the rising cost of living pressures, hurting seniors who don't see their pension income, uh, they see their fixed income static and they see everything from property taxes to price of gas to, to their bills going up. That's especially worse for single seniors. If they, if they lose their partner, they have the same cost to stay in their home and much less ability to react to it. So we're gonna be proposing a series of measures to help, to help seniors, to help them across the board, but also to provide direct assistance, particularly to that single senior group so that people can have some flexibility to stay in their own home longer. Um, this is another area where our national mental health action plan, we're seeing uh, a terrible rise in, in, in isolation in seniors and in even some case uh, abuse and, and fraud and, and things being perpetrated upon seniors as almost a, some vulnerable populations. We're committed to, to addressing that as well. Okay, thank you. And I, I apologize if I'm kind of just jumping all over the place here and going into question after question, but you know, we, we want to hear from you and we have quite a few questions coming through. So I'm, I'm just trying to get into uh, as many as I can. So great. So great. in your in your previous comments, you you mentioned the hike in gas prices. So that is a question that has been come in. Uh, so will the Conservative Party be addressing the continual hike in our gas prices, especially with possible proposed hikes due to limited oil coming in? 
Yeah, the price at the pump is is shocking, and I I, I know it's most shocking in in British Columbia even more than than in my neck of the woods in southern Ontario. This is why, from the federal standpoint, um, we oppose Mr. Trudeau's carbon tax because what he's committed to the tripling of his federal tax um, that will see higher prices for all Canadians. You know, British Columbia has priced carbon and has had a provincial carbon tax for for a decade. But the federal government, if, if they start encroaching with higher prices, there's, there's concern that that's going to be even more, uh, more pressure on, on the system, higher prices, even for, for provinces like BC that was, was pricing carbon and, and having its own system of taxation. So we would like to see a different approach. In my climate change plan, we're offering an alternative uh, to the Mr. Trudeau approach, especially for provinces that uh, that that had fought the federal backstop in court. Um, BC is in a bit of a unique case, but we do see the the increasing pressures across the board. One thing I, I also think Canada has has been too slow under Mr. Trudeau to respond to has been energy independence and security for Canada and the US. We saw a cyber attack in the US affecting gas supply for the eastern seaboard. We need to have uh, integrated support, including pipelines, including our electricity grid, to make sure that there's energy security for Canada and the U.S. That includes projects like Keystone XL, Line 5. We have to do a lot to counter this kind of anti-pipeline, anti-anything rhetoric we're seeing from the parties on the left to, to allow people to understand that we need to have, for our economy, we need to have that energy security between Canada and the U.S. for a strong integrated economy, for more predictable prices at the pump for Canadians and for small businesses. And we need to return to that special relationship Canada had with the United States. It seems to have evaporated over the last six years, and this will be a top priority for me as Prime Minister. Okay. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come up uh, more than once, and that's something that we've been hearing quite a bit, is populist maturity. So I know we've had different conversations about the younger generation and fiscal responsibility and understanding, as it's kind of worded here in this question, the price to pay for spending. What, what would you say to our younger generation. I know you mentioned that earlier, we're here to support our future generations. Do you feel there is a disconnect there? I fear that the Liberals budget showed that they believe Canadians are okay with $100 billion deficits outside of a crisis, right? Um, as I said at the outset, and Mark said in his remarks, we, we supported emergency programs to help people in a crisis, even when we knew they needed to be improved. But I think all Canadians know that that crisis level of spending can't continue forever. I think the challenge for some younger folks, and you know what's interesting, I, the Conservative Party, we have the biggest caucus of millennials in the, in the House of Commons. Uh, including uh, Mission Masqui, Fraser Canyon, Brad Viss, are my housing shadow minister. We've got a number of MPs in their, in their young 30s, and they don't really know in their adult life interest rates at anything other than rock bottom levels. We can't plan our future based on historic and almost uh, you know, planned extreme low interest rates. We have to plan for the uncertainty of the next few years and the almost certain fact that interest rates will be a little bit higher. And, and uh, I really worry that people are trying to ignore that fact. Minister Freeland kind of suggests this is the time to run big deficits. It's very hard to wind down big deficits. This is why we've said our plan will be getting the budget back to fiscal balance over the course of the next decade, because in the short term, as I said earlier, we're gonna have some targeted packages to let small businesses get back on their feet in Maple Ridge, Pitt Meadows, and in Bowmanville, Ontario, where I'm from. 
We need them to survive because two thirds of Canadians work for a smaller, medium sized business. But I think people know as the economy continues to recover, we need to get the spending under control in a, in a balanced way. That's our commitment. No, no austerity plan, but a responsibility plan that none of the parties, the NDP, the Liberals and the Greens seem to outspend each other. They think that's leadership. I think our leadership is tr trying to help people provide balance and, and ensure that our health care, our old age security, the vulnerable seniors, that we can support them because we haven't spent away our future today. Thank you. You mentioned Brad Tvis, uh, Shadow Minister for Housing. So we do have a question here on housing. Again, it's, it's on housing prices. So we're saying prices here are too high in BC. What will the Conservative Party do to help this problem for new homeowners? We do hear a lot too with, with the way things are right now and you men mentioned the younger generation not really understanding interest rates or, or things like that. I mean, many people are being told even in their classes that they're not gonna be able to purchase a home. So, so what would we do to, uh, to work towards solving that or, or bettering it? Uh, another important question and why I've put uh, Brad on this file, our first shadow minister for housing. And Brad and I've talked about this because there's three aspects to the housing uh, file. There's, you know, the troubling issue of, of homelessness and, and, and people at the margins. There's affordable housing and, and the need for the government to, to move faster there to, to form better partnerships, including with nonprofits. And then there's how can we make home ownership accessible to that next generation? And I talk, I've talked to the, the tech community in British Columbia about this. That's Vancouver's a great tech hub. You know, there's some incredible innovation. One of the big roadblocks they're telling us is that inability to, to, to access the housing market in a way that people can see coming out of university or college with some student debt tackling that and just giving up on home ownership. So we're going to have a series of policies that try and address each in a responsible way. Federal government has a direct role when it comes to, to CMHC, when it comes to uh, more, you know, the federal rules with respect to mortgages, uh, money laundering, and, and, and a few other issues. We also need to partner with the municipalities and the provinces on the supply issue and on approvals to get things moving. And I've actually spoken to um, some mayors across, across British Columbia to see the different approaches different municipalities are having, whether on the island, on, in the lower mainland. And I think more of a national conversation to, to accelerate uh, that supply piece and for a federal funding component is needed. This is a good opportunity for me to say my leadership style. I am not an Ottawa knows best politician. Uh, I actually know that sometimes Ottawa has to show leadership by partnering or following the lead and being a funding partner, not claiming we have the, the solution to all issues, particularly when sometimes we're so far removed from the needs on the ground. So I'm, I'm about building partnerships. And as I said, this housing piece, particularly in the lower mainland, the affordability crisis, some of the folks at the margin, you've been living through some of the most acute cute challenges the country has faced. That's why I've put Brad on this file and we're gonna have some smart policy in the next election. Yes, we, we have seen the uh, letters come through uh, from the Shadow Minister for Housing uh, looking for feedback. So you know, we appreciate that that is, is something that we're seeing collaboration. Like you said, partnerships are key and that's something that we've been learning throughout this pandemic as well. So. So we are at 1241, so I'm going to wrap it up with a final question. And that question is, will there be an audit of the COVID rescue plan fund? Um, simple answer is yes. In fact, I've said we need, we need a public inquiry into the pandemic response. In fact, I called for this many months ago along with the appointment of a monitor. And what I, what I, why I was suggesting a monitor, I think there's been so many lessons learned throughout the pandemic that we haven't even actioned on between the first wave and the third wave. 
that that monitor could do a real-time monitoring to make sure that we we learn the lessons and have a better response. And I, I've been uh, I've been um, interested to see people like Dr. Naylor, who gave who provided the report after the SARS crisis, calling for the same approach. So I want to make sure we have a lessons learned so that we're better. The fourth pillar of my Canada recovery plan is to make sure that we have better capacity, we're more self-sufficient, we're ready in the future. And part of that will go into an audit of spending too, because I'll tell you, the Parliament of Canada was, was called off, was prorogued to stop questions from being asked on the WE scandal. We also saw a former Liberal MP receiving untendered contracts. There were massive spending contracts go out to companies that no one can kind of see why they were awarded the contract because they'd never performed that type of work. A lot of people have questions about how opaque the government has been as hundreds of millions of dollars were going out the door. Of course, there's going to be a bit of chaos in a crisis, but what we were concerned with with the WEE scandal, and it was confirmed by the ethics commissioner last week, there seems to be one rule, one special access for friends of the Trudeau government, whether it's SNC-Lavalin or we, and one lineup for every other Canadian small business. And that is unfair. That erodes people's trust in politicians, in our, in our federal institutions. So our second pillar of our recovery plan, that accountability plan, we're the only party really advocating for that. You know, in fact, Mr. Trudeau is cobbling together coalitions uh, with the other parties on, on C-10 and a range of other bills limiting debate. We want more transparency. We want accountability. And for me as a veteran, I also want to see things like the cover-up of the sexual misconduct allegations in the armed forces. We need, we need people to see that we're going to hold people to account and we're going to demand better. And that's why accountability is the second pillar of our recovery plan. So in your recovery plan, you mentioned trust. So what is what is your biggest, I guess, trust on, on the recovery plan? Where do you think is the most important feature in the recovery plan? Well, I think the most important feature is our first pillar. It is that economic piece. It is that million job commitment in one year and addressing the highly affected sectors. A lot of people have talked about the 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 she session how i spoke to uh, uh, a tourism organization of, of travel agents 85 percent of their members women entrepreneurs and literally have not been able to get their unique issues addressed by the federal government so they see billions being spent and they can't even can't even see their their industry get reflected in the programs some of the the rent assistance as I said at the beginning, they went to the landlords and so many landlords opted out. It took us five to six months of pushing to get changes made to that program. I want people to see that we're going to put the needs of small business, the needs of those often family-owned businesses front and center. We want our programs to be flexible. We want them, if their fix is made, they need to be made quickly. And we want as many people as possible to be, to be able to access them. Because I'll tell you, and you would know this, Flory, from your own members, there's a lot that have taken on higher debts throughout this crisis. There are some that won't be able to afford another series of restrictions and lockdowns. And there are some that are worried that CERB or UBI will make it almost impossible for them to hire and find employees. So we need a government that respects entrepreneurs and small businesses again. And I, and I can't stress this enough, we're the only one that's been advocating consistently. So for me, that first pillar, getting people working, you know, talking about the nobility of working, whether you're opening your small business in Pitt Meadows at 5 a.m. in the morning, or whether you're driving to a, to a mill in, in the interior, there's an inherent value in that. And that's what we have to harness to get this country working after the pandemic. Well, again, I know we were at 1247, so we took a couple extra minutes away from you here, but we do respect your time and we do thank you so much for being here to speak with us, our members, our communities. 
And we're going to do our best to see if we can maybe amalgamate some of the questions that we didn't get to because there was quite a few. Um, and there was also some tie-ins with some of the other things that we were talking about as well. So again, we thank you for your time and we'll close off there if you have anything to say uh, in closing. Yeah, maybe we'll do one more pan out to the beautiful Pitt Meadows Maple Ridge, the closest I can get to it today, <laughs> Flory. You are in a beautiful part of the country, beautiful BC. Thank you for your advocacy for small businesses. And any of those questions, get them to Mark Dalton. He is passionate. He's always talking about small business. And so we are here to, to serve and to listen and to make sure all Canadians enjoy a recovery after the pandemic. So my best wishes of health and thanks to all your members. Thank you. We appreciate that. And take care, everyone. We will close off now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.